Here we go. Hello and um, welcome to Alta Live. It takes a hot minute for our crowd to fill in to the Zoom room. Um, so while you do that, I will just welcome you. Welcome, welcome to Alta Live. I'm here with Dr. Lauren Esposito and we are going to be chatting about queer scientists and scorpions, which might not seem to go together, but they absolutely do. Um, so we're gonna have a really fun chat. It's nice to see um, so many people filling in. Hi everyone and welcome. Um, while you come in, I will get my spiel out of the way. Again, thank you for joining Alta Live. Today's guest is Dr. Lauren Esposito. Lauren is a curator and schlinger, schlinger chair of arachnology at the California Academy of Sciences, Cal Academy we love. Her current research investigates the patterns and processes of the evolution of spiders and scorpions with a focus on tropical islands. Lauren is also the co-creator of 500 Queer Scientists, a visibility campaign for LGBTQ plus people working in STEM careers. So we're going to talk about all of that with Dr. Esposito, who's allowed me to call her Lauren today. Thank you. Um, first, some brief housekeeping. Alta Live is a digital interview series we do here at Alta Journal. I'm Beth Spotswood, I'm Alta's digital editor. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Alta, we are a quarterly magazine focused on California and the West. We host a monthly California book club. We do events like these every Wednesday that aim to kind of expand upon our articles like this one about Lauren. Um, she is this quarter's trailblazer. A trailblazer is someone in California in the West who is um, blazing an incredible and necessary trail. And we are so excited to welcome her here today. If you've got questions for Dr. Esposito, we are absolutely gonna get to them. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions. We're gonna chat for about 25 minutes and then get to as many of your questions as we can. Don't worry, we've gotten several emails um, particularly from students and professors saying they can't come right now, but will this be recorded? Yes, it will. We're going to send an email to all of you um, with the video link as well as post it to altaonline.com later this afternoon. I always like to ask folks to get started um, in the chat by letting us know where they're zooming in from. So kick open um, the chat section and I'm up here in Novato, California curious to know if there's scorpions around. Um, Lauren, where are you today? I'm in San Francisco. I'm in the basement of the California Academy of Sciences sitting in my office. You are sitting in your office and this is in fact, I love, I'm so pleased um, that this is, you, you've lined up the visual of being in the exact space where you were photographed. This is right there. It's right there, <laughs> right there. And in fact, you just revealed that you have some dead um, scorpions hiding behind you. We do. Um, I have some specimens, as we call oh, them. Oh, so, so <laughs> we so scientifically we call them specimens. <laughs> In um, the layman's terms, dead scorpions or specimens. Hi from New Hampshire, Cupertino, Daly City. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, so kind of first and foremost, when did you, did young Lauren discover scor scorpions were awesome? I, I mean, I don't think that young Lauren ever really discovered the scorpions were awesome. Young Lauren was like everybody else in the world, virtually uh, terrified of scorpions. I would see them. I think, you know, the place I remember very consistently finding scorpions was in the, the like little manhole cover that you open up to check the water meter on the sidewalk, you know, like where the water main valve yeah, shut yeah, yeah. off is from your house. So like me and my friends would go and open up that little manhole cover and like look down in there and there'd be scorpions in there sometimes. It was a very terrifying experience. Um, but little Lauren was super into like insects. And so I was like always in the backyard flipping over all the pavers in the garden and like turning over the pots and stuff like that. That I mean, in hindsight was probably destroying my parents' very careful gardening work, but <laughs> Uh, I would find things under there, things that are pretty common in urban areas like cockroaches and crickets and other like earwigs and creepy crawly kind of stuff. Uh, and I would bring them inside in my house alive. Oh, really? And my mom wasn't super keen on that. Um, so she taught me how to make a, a what in sort of common entomology terms is a killing jar, which basically means it's super sophisticated. You take an old plastic peanut butter jar and you put a cotton ball soaked in fingernail polish remover in it. And then it's euthanizes insects like safely and humanely 
Uh, and then they're not alive anymore when your children bring them inside. Uh, and so you can make an insect collection of your own. Of specimens. Specimens. They are now specimens. Uh, not dead cockroaches, specimens. Exactly. Uh, so, so I did that as a kid. And I think that that was sort of like my earliest introduction, thanks to my um, incredible biologist mother, uh, to insects and how to study them safely without bringing cockroaches in the house that were alive. So your mom was a biologist. My mom is, I mean, I would say she is a biologist even still because anybody can be a scientist. Like you don't need a degree or, or, or anything else to be a scientist. You just need to be able to make observations and interpret the world around you. But my mom did go to school for biology. So yeah. it was in the, it's in the blood. It's in um, the blood. I, I thought we might kind of take this opportunity. Cal Academy, God bless him, has a very cool two and a half minute video of Lauren at work. And I thought it would be fun to share with everyone. So I'm going to go for it. And we're just going to fly by the seat of our pants um, and share this video of Lauren at work. There's some scorpions in here that just want to be found. If I was a scorpion, I'd be really into this spot right here. This is definitely prime scorpion food. Like, if I was a scorpion, I'd just be feasting on termites all day, every day. They're like soft and squishy and delicious. Oh, I found one. It's a baby scorpion. There are absolutely scorpions in the Bay Area. In fact, California is one of the most diverse places on earth for scorpions. We have somewhere between four and six species of scorpions locally. The good thing is that none of the ones we have here are dangerous. And this is the Pacific Forest scorpion. Uh, that's a saw finger. That's a common California. Is it common California? Outstanding. Most of them, if it's done, you would feel like anywhere from a thumbtack to a bee. Some scorpions can only make venom that's used for killing their prey. Other scorpions can make venom for killing prey, but also they make venom for protecting themselves against their predators. And so those are the scorpions that tend to be dangerous to humans because the predators of scorpions are things like other mammals. It opens people's minds to the fact that these animals certainly aren't trying to attack us. Without the black light, I would never have seen that. They have this pigment embedded in the exoskeleton that fluoresces ultraviolet light. And what that means is rather than reflecting like a mirror reflects light, it actually absorbs the light and excites the light and bounces the light back at a different wavelength. I don't know that I ever at any point in my life thought I love scorpions and this is what I want to dedicate my life to and then set out on a path to become a scorpion biologist. It was more that I sort of found them so incredibly intriguing. The moms, you know, they carry the babies around in the beginning for the first month or so. They're the only arachnids that give birth to live young, which is really bizarre adaptation that has enabled them to be successful for almost 450 million years on Earth. Having the diversity of scorpions in my own backyard is something that's really incredible and, and not something that you can experience in most other places in this country. Um, that is awesome. I love it. Now, do you often, when you go, is hunting the right word? When you go kind of looking and you've traveled the world, you don't just study scorpions in California or the Bay Area. You are a global, you're interested in kind of the global scorpions. Um, is, do you work a lot at night? Is that, I didn't realize that was a component of yeah. scorpion study. Yeah, I work a ton at night. Um, you, you know, and usually we work, when we're out in the field uh, in, a, in a place and we've traveled you know, half the world to get there, we're trying to maximize our time. And so we work during the day and we work at night. Uh, we usually put in 16 or so hours a day looking for spiders and scorpions and other arachnid type of, of things. Um, and so yeah, night, night's a, a big part of it. Things that are nocturnal are active at night and your like best chance of finding them is to be out when they're out. So we usually head out just right after sunset. So you, there is so much to find um, online about Lauren's work with scorpions. And it's really, 
I mean, I kind of spent a day procrastinating from work and just learning, watching Lauren talk about scorpions on the internet, which is really fun and I highly suggest it. Um, but you also created 500 queer scientists. Can you tell us about that, um, what that organization is and its mission? So uh, 500 Queer Scientists is really, it really started as a visibility campaign for LGBTQ plus identifying people who work in science, technology, engineering, math, medicine, or fields that are aligned with those like teachers or people that work in public policy. Um, and it really started as a way for people to share their identities of being an LGBTQ person alongside their identity of being a scientist. Um, and, and I think the reason for that is that for most, scientists alive today, we've been told through the culture of science that we should keep our identities private and hidden. Um, that when you come into the lab, you take off your rainbow hat or whatever, and you put on your white lab coat and you enter the lab as this like identity list person who just focuses on science and that that's somehow beneficial for science. But it's not. Uh, the, the reality is, is that that's not beneficial for science to leave your identity at the door and the idea that it is, is an idea that's been perpetuated by the history of science, which was dominated by European descended white men who were allowed to specify the, the, the narrow identity within which you could exist in science. And, and so that, that's no longer the case. Now there's people from all walks of life who do science with all different identities and bringing that identity to work helps you be better at your job for one. How, how so? Well, so for one, I think you just need to think about like how we solve the crises that we're facing in the world. So we, we turn to science, we turn to technology to try to overcome the problems that we're experiencing. For, for example, the COVID-19 epidemic, like we turn to science for solutions to the epidemic. And when you think about how science works, it runs off ideas. Innovation comes from ideas and you, get greater diversity of ideas when you have greater diversity of people supplying those ideas in the first place. So if we wanna increase the rate at which we're solving global problems, we need diversity and we need to embrace that diversity and celebrate it so that the diversity of ideas is welcomed into the room. One of the things I saw you speak about in um, your work around 500 core scientists is what I found kind of surprising numbers of the number of scientists who are uncomfortable being out at work, who feel mm -hmm. harassed or um, dismissed at work, who, who aren't even out at work at all. Mm -hmm. um, is part of this to, to encourage people to let them know that there is a community of scientists and that they're not alone? Yeah, I mean, I think that that, that like fundamentally is what it comes down to. When I, when I launched the campaign, it was from a kind of a selfish perspective, but I didn't know anybody else that was queer in my field of research. And so when I launched this campaign, I was the curator of arachnology at the California Academy of Sciences, which is in San Francisco, like one of the gay friendliest cities in America. And there was no other queer curators in now or in the history of the institution, uh, which is telling of the experience for most queer scientists, which is that they don't know anybody, they don't have community. And there may be other people out there. And in fact, like in my field, there, there were. It just wasn't something we were ever told was okay to talk about. And so it leads to this place where you feel really isolated. Um, and so part of the campaign was just like, hey, like we're here, we're queer, we're doing science, we're propelling society forward. And like, we wanna be celebrated for that and celebrate ourselves for it. And presumably by knowing that you're not alone, by knowing that you're part of a community, you can look, feel more confident and lose yourself more in the work and thus do better work. I'm absolutely. That, but. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. I mean, and it's also like a war against attrition, right? Like when people don't see themselves reflected in the community of people that are doing the thing they wanna do, oftentimes they make the decision either consciously or unconsciously that, that they don't belong there and that they should leave. And right now we, there's an estimated 125,000 LGBTQ people were missing from the science, technology, engineering, and math workforce in the United States based on what we know about the rates of people leaving STEM that have those identities. So like we're missing a lot of people and that means we're missing a lot of ideas, we're missing a lot of innovation, 
Um, but we also have a, a deficit workforce like here in California and the biotech industry is booming. It's like one of the largest industries and the largest growing industries in the state. And there's a workforce deficit. We don't have enough people to fill the roles that we like have created that are based around innovation. So we need to keep that workforce in place. We need them to stay in the pathway of science so that they can go on and make the next discovery and solve, cure the next disease and figure out how we're gonna stop climate change and all the other things that we need to solve. So does it, does someone who identifies as queer and is working in STEM, can they join? What's the process? What do you, how does it work? Yeah, it's just like a self self submission form. So if you identify as a scientist or somebody who works in technology, engineering, math, you're a teacher, you're working in public policy, advocating for science, whatever the case may be, um, or maybe even a science journalist, uh, you can join, you just submit all your information on a form, you add your photo, we put it up on the website, we post it on social media, uh, we share the with the world, your personal story of success and overcoming barriers or just celebrating who you are. How's it, what's the response been like? Uh, so when we started, we we called it 500 Career Science as sort of an aspirational goal. Oh. Um, we started with 50 people and now we're at over 1,700. Are you gonna and change get, the name? I mean, I feel like maybe like when we hit 5,000, maybe I'll just like tack on another, another zero. zero. <laughs> Um, I want to segue back to scorpions because I have a lot of questions about your okay. work with scorpions. Um, I know that you've traveled all over the world. I mean, really all over the world to the little yeah. pockets of places where you would need to dig and lift up rocks to find scorpions. Have you ever, first of all, is it a scorpion sting that we're, have you ever been stung by a scorpion and what happened? I've been stung by one scorpion. It's right here in California. And it was a scorpion that was like very grumpy after having been passed around to about 54 or five year olds. Um, and at, <laughs> at some point, the scorpion very politely informed me in a, in a non dramatic way, just like a little flick of the tail that he had had enough of four year old hands and wanted to go back under his log. So yes, one time it felt like a very mild bee sting, and I promptly returned him to his home. <laughs> Did the 54 and five-year-olds freak out? No, they didn't even see that it had happened because it was really like, a, it was white, really subtle. So the, the scorpions that are here in California, are there any that we, I'm terrified of all of them. Um, should that be the case? No. And there's like, I feel like there's a few things we should get out of the way. Number one, scorpions can't jump. So they like, cannot, they cannot jump. They can't jump. Okay. So if you're like observing it from a safe distance, like you're fine. So that's one, I think that's one fear alleviated. Like it's not going to like come after you and jump on you. Um, number two, scorpions here in the state of California are not dangerous to humans. Um, they like, they're not will, deadly. They're not deadly. They're not like, you're not hospital bound. If you get stung. like nothing will happen to you other than some localized pain. Um, they don't contain, they don't produce the kinds of things in their venom that target the nervous system of humans. And so the pain is going to be like more akin to a, a mild bee sting than to like electricity, which is the kind of feeling sensation that you feel in some other kinds of scorpions that make these kind of human specific toxins. Where is the, where can one find the deadliest of scorpions? Well, in the United States, there's one species that's potentially lethal to young children and people with compromised immune systems, uh, and it's in Arizona. It's the Arizona bark scorpion. There has not been a death from an Arizona bark scorpion in, I think, 60 years or something like that. Um, but there are regular hospitalizations of young kids. Luckily, we have a commercial antivenom um, that, that is being produced. And um, that antivenom like, works really well as long as you get to a hospital in a reasonable amount of time. Like, many hours that you can have the effects reversed um for some really gnarly scorpions that can kill yeah. about humans like there's a, there's about there's about half a dozen species in mexico uh, and historically there's been like up to a thousand deaths a year from scorpion stings in, Mex in mexico so like these can kill you um like they're no joke there's also commercial antivenin available for them so as long as you know you got stung by a scorpion, you're able to communicate that to someone else who can get you to a hospital and you can get treatment, you're fine. 
Um, I think the the problem comes in where when people are like in really rural settings and may right. not even be able to get to like another person in time to communicate that. And so they they run into trouble, which kind of looks the the resulting effects. It, it's sort of a um, spiral of effects that occur, but like the ultimate result is high blood pressure that leads to some like, symptoms that seem like a heart attack. And so oftentimes those people, when they get to the hospital, they're being confused for having had a heart attack, but they've actually just been stung by a scorpion. Is there in your in your scientist dream, is there like, have you have you, is there a scorpion that you have yet to study that is out there in some pocket of Patagonia that where what's the dream scorpion to study that's just impossible to find? Well, I mean, I think the the dream scorpion to study is any scorpion that hasn't been studied yet and so that means there's a lot like there's so far we, we we're like in this renaissance period of scorpion discovery like up until up until about 30 years ago the number of scorpions that scientists documented each year were like in the maybe like 10 or fewer and starting about 30 years ago, we start, we like increase that by, by, by a whole bunch. So now oftentimes the, the number that are documented formally each year, are like in the dozens, um, How did that happen? well, this thing, UV light and the ability of us to carry a UV light around with us in the field, like in the early days in like the late seventies, eighties, even the very first days where people discovered this UV light trick, they would take like a car battery with like a shoulder strap and like a long fluorescent tube and they would like carry this car battery around with them out in the desert they had to charge it up every night like off of a car um and <laughs> nowadays we just have a little flashlight that like you put batteries in you can recharge the batteries and just out like household outlet it's super easy um and so that uv light has like been a game changer because it used to be you'd just go out and you'd like turn over rocks and logs all day long and you'd find like two scorpions and now you go out at night and like scorpions are in high abundance when you find them they're usually like dozens of them out at night in a in like a 20 minute walk have you found um in terms of working in san francisco a kind of the preeminent place for scientists to, for biologists to study in san francisco um since the founding of 500 queer scientists or since being kind of out as like come to me if you have if you're interested in this and you identify as queer um have people been have has cal academy seen an increase um of at least interest if not employees and staff and volunteers who identify as queer Ooh, that's a great question and i don't actually like know the full answer or the full picture of it like because on a staff level well, one thing to know about like being queer is that nobody collects demographics on that. Like we don't collect it in the census. We don't collect it in this, like the way that we find out about scientists or, or like people moving through the path of, of science is from this national survey that's administered by the National Science Foundation. And it tracks people through time. So it helps us understand like when, when and, and why people quit or leave science and also like how how many African Americans are in science? How many Hispanic people? How many women? How many men? All of those sorts of things. We don't ask questions about LGBTQ identities. Um, that's not a question that's asked. It's not a question that's tracked. And so all the information we have, like you were mentioning at the beginning, those statistics about how many people are out, how many people have been made to feel uncomfortable, that's all just self-reported survey data that like other individuals have taken it upon themselves to try to collect. Um, and so we don't know, and, and just like we don't know, like on a national level, I don't know in the institution how many people have started volunteering that identify in that way. Um, what I do know is that last year, right as we reopened from, the, from being closed for the pandemic, we launched a new exhibit out on the public floor of the Cal Academy called New Science, which focuses on queer and intersectional identities of people who are scientists. So. Uh, it includes people of color that are, are lesbian identifying, trans identifying, um, people who are like, queer and immigrants, like all sorts of intersectional ways that they're, that has made them or given them a unique perspective and identity, how that's made their science stronger um, and why we're like super excited to celebrate them up on our public floor at the Cal Academy. And so that's exciting. And I think that I have heard you know, through sort of the grapevine of people just like overhearing conversations as they walk by that that's been really empowering 
particularly for queer identifying families. So oftentimes like same sex parents who bring their children to the academy and their children get to see reflected on the public floor of a science institution, people who look like their family, people that they identify with. Um, and so I think that that's really important and really like solidifies why this matters and why sharing your identity in a public way, if you're able to do so, if you're like in a position where you're safe and comfortable and your employment secured um, to share your identity with those people that might wonder if this is a place for them or if they belong here. Um, again, everyone is watching Alta Live right now. If you have questions for Dr. Lauren Esposito, please use them in the Q&A button um, down below. We've got about 10 minutes left. So Lauren, I'm curious, um, when, when students come through, I imagine that this also kind of plants the seed of, I mean, I remember when I was a kid going on field trips and walking around, if there was a, a woman that I was like, oh, wow, you do this? Maybe that means I can do it too. I imagine that the youth, the LGBTQ plus queer youth um, is particularly attracted to this if for no other reason that they have a little bit more freedom um, and support in terms of coming out, being out now. Is that yeah. the case? Yeah, I think that's the case. I will say that since launching 500 Career Sciences, the majority of students who have applied to work in my lab personally have identified identify as queer and are reaching out to me and my lab because not because their like life dream was to study scorpions, like get almost guarantee that. It's because it feels like a place where they can see themselves or where they feel safe and that they can bring their whole identity when they move forward through their educational pathway. Um, and so that that's definitely like a been a reassuring thing, like something that makes tells me like you're doing the right thing. You should keep investing your effort and time, which is all like extracurricular time. Of course, something I do on my own time. Um, and I think I also like through 500 Career Sciences on a regular basis get like little emails and notes from from young people, especially that are like, this isn't like, I came across this through whatever way, like somebody posted it on Instagram uh, and like, it's really empowering and really reassuring for me to know that, that this, that there's a place for me in science and that I can do this. And, and, and so I think that that's super exciting. And then the last thing that I think is really reassuring is that like since launching 500 Career Sciences, and I, I'm not gonna claim credit for this, but I have noticed that like a number of other organizations have popped up that are focused on on like more specific identities so like queer people in chemistry or trans identifying people in science or um podcasts that are focusing on like sharing stories of individuals oftentimes found through the 500 queer sciences database uh, and so that's all i think like very reaffirming that this is important and it's and it's work that i'm going to keep doing until i don't have any fight left in me i guess but hopefully we never get there. <laughs> is it true that you're finding more and more fluorescent animals on both land in the water? Yeah, there's Why? there's actually been a ton of recent uh, recent documentation that has shown like all sorts of things fluoresce. And so like in the water, there's tons of stuff. If you go out to tide pools um, when it's still dark or like at night. Uh, so if there's like a good low tide at night or before dawn and you take a UV light, like everything fluoresces. It's crazy. Really? Yeah. And similarly, if you go out with a UV light at night and look around for scorpions, like you start noticing all sorts of stuff. So like fungus often fluoresces, there's millipedes that fluoresce, there's insects that fluoresce. Um, and a lot of things, a lot of other species are able to see outside of the color spectrum that we can see. And so they're able to see within the UV spectrum as well. So like flowers often have UV patterns that we can't see with our eyes. So if you shine a UV light on it, like you see the UV pattern and it's thought that it like helps to attract insects that see in the UV spectrum. So there's, yeah, UV is like a huge part of communication that we usually don't have access to because our eyes are not good enough. A game changer. Um, last question. I don't know if you're allowed to tell us this. What are you working on in the lab, in your lab right now? That's top secret. It's no, not. Um, it's not. Um, so right now in my lab, most of the things that we're working on are questions about how spiders or scorpions have evolved through time. Um, and one of those questions is focused on California. So we're looking at the, the one scorpion that's ever stung me, the Western forest scorpion. I was also like featured in that little video clip you showed at the beginning. Uh, it's found in forested areas all over um, like central through Northern California. 
And we have been going around the entire state collecting scorpions. And what we're trying to understand from their genetics is how the populations are connected. So like how these populations in different little forest patches all over the state are connected, how long they've been there. So sort of doing like an ancestry.com for scorpions. Um, and also trying to understand what the fire regimes that are increasing and are cutting off these populations from each other, what impact that's gonna have for the future of like, not just scorpions, but, but plants and animals that live in these forests, but using scorpions as like the model for how that might happen. Cause you know, let's be honest, like they're not, they don't fly. They're not the best walkers. Like they're kind of slow and clumsy. And so if these, if these are gonna get cut off then things that are worse at, at moving between areas cause they're tiny or they're just bad at moving are gonna have problems, but things that can move better might also experience the same kinds of problems as well. Do scorpions, the, the fact that scorpions are so old, the longevity component to scorpions make them a particularly good indicator of what the future might look like, just because they've survived so long, presumably yeah, they're sure. tell us what the future looks like. Well, one of the things that, that's so cool about the fact that they're so old is that they've evolved along with with entire ecosystems, right? Like they've been, they were here before the current day ecosystems that we see. And so like before there was such thing as a redwood forest, there was a scorpion living in that place. And as the redwood forest ecosystem like sprouted up and like the evolved redwood trees and all the things that live on and around redwood trees, the scorpions like went along for the ride. And so we, not only are scorpions really good at adapting to different ecosystems, but they're also super sensitive to change. And so by examining what happens to scorpions, which are a top predator, like on the small scale, they're like the wolves of little things, right? Uh, by examining what happens to scorpions, we have a good idea of what will happen to the whole ecosystem. And in particular, when ecosystems start to collapse and like when things fall apart, scorpions will give us a pretty good clue. Interesting, the wolves of little things. I love it. Um, oh, last question from Kiri. Can, can people just use an ordinary UV flashlight? Yeah, the best is that you, like you can find them at the hardware store. A lot of times they sell them for like finding animal like pet pee in your house um but the best the best wavelength is like between 395 um and 405 so if you like oftentimes it will show what the wavelength is on the flashlight if you, you can buy them like on your favorite big box stores on the internet uh you'll, you'll see we do not there. we do not promote big box stores at all to laugh <laughs> um <laughs> That's well, or you could carry around a car battery, apparently, if you really wanted to go and a fluorescent school. tube. <laughs> like you could, you could probably also get a UV light at, at a like a pet store if, if, if there's a pet store near you. Um, sure, exactly. Um, with that, that's okay. Well, everyone's going to go out and buy their UV lights and go. Is that exhibit um, of intersectionality still at Cal Academy? We can come visit. Yeah, it's Ask at Cal Academy. You can safely. come. New Science. Yeah, it's up on the public. New Science. If you're not near the Cal Academy, you can also see it online. If you just go to Google Arts and Culture and look up New Science, it's an exhibit at the on the Cal Academy's Google Arts and Culture page. Um, we are going to send you, you all a link virtually. Virtual we will New send Science. Everyone on this meeting will get a link to it. Um, Lauren, you are an awesome educator. Thank you so much for this. This is and a trailblazer. Thank you. Um, before everyone goes, I want to make sure um, to let you know, again, this is recorded. We're going to email it to everyone and post it on altaonline.com later today, as we do with all of our episodes. Um, and please join us next week, where we are going to talk about the gentrification of psychedelics with Roberto Lovato in conversation with Gustavo Ariano. Um, so that should be fun as well. That is a week from today, Wednesday, February 2nd, I think at 1230 there, there whatever next Wednesday is, um, please do How come are we in that. February. We're in February. Yeah, you're my last January. Um, again, thank you, Dr. Lauren Esposito at Cal Academy. Um, and thanks to everyone for coming. Pro science, wear a mask. Thanks. Take care. <laughs>